The following video contains spoilers for the entirety of Fire Emblem Three Houses. I've made a grave error. I've been reading the YouTube comments on videos related to Fire Emblem Three Houses, specifically YouTube comments about the character of Edelgard, and they made me quite upset. I don't usually get angry at people for having opinions I disagree with about media I care about, but the YouTube comment section has some thoughts so monumentally stupid that I can't just shrug them off. To have opinions this bad, you have to either be very dumb or be making a concerted effort to misinterpret everything that the game tells you about this character in what I guess must be some intentional drive to make the game actively worse for yourself. What this video is, is a defense of Edelgard as a character who has understandable motivations and who stands with the three other lords, including Rhea, as a reasonable person to admire, and someone worth following as a leader. I, personally, think Edelgard is the best choice for the future of Fodlin, and find myself thinking she's probably on the right side of history on this one. As far as Three Houses has a best ending, I think Crimson Flower is it. What this video is not, is a defense of Edelgard as a flawless person. Just like Dimitri and Rhea, she does some truly awful stuff over the course of the game, and she holds some values that I find abhorrent. What makes Three Houses interesting is the fact that every single one of the people who hold the reins of the narrative are highly unstable individuals who do awful shit in the pursuit of their convictions, except maybe Claude, who is much more moral, much more stable, and much less effective at making change happen than the other lords. It's why the game expects you to play through it at least three or four times. The entire point of Three Houses' split narrative is to show every side of a bloody conflict, where there's no definitive good guy. That's the tragedy at the game's core. It's about mostly good people with mostly good intentions, doomed to never see eye to eye due to their opposing convictions. If, as people seem to think for some stupid reason, one of the lords was the good guy who exclusively does good things, and the others were bad people who exclusively do bad things, the game would be boring and worthless. This is to say that what this video is not is an argument that Edelgard is perfect and has no flaws. She absolutely does, some massive ones, and that's what makes the principal characters in this game interesting. The entire reason playing through the game more than once is worthwhile is because you get to learn about the story's central conflict from all angles. Claude comes across as a wimpy pushover once his schemes fail in Crimson Flower and Azure Moon, but in Verdant Wind it turns out that that's because he never really cared about gaining power in the first place. Claude is happy merely to see Fodlin unified. He just thought he'd have to be the one to do it but he is content to give up that mantle to anyone that beats him to it as long as he thinks they can handle it. As it turns out, his priorities aren't in the same place as Edelgard's and Dimitri's. He's Almyron, and he's mostly interested in using the fact that he happens to be from an influential Fodlinese family to improve relations between the two nations, something he obviously trusts that Edelgard, Dimitri, or Byleth will be willing to cooperate with him on once he claims the throne in Almyra. Meanwhile, Dimitri seems like, and frankly just is, an insane bloodthirsty lunatic in Verdant Wind and Silver Snow. He gets his people massacred in the battle at Grondor, because he's unable to let go of his hatred for Edelgard, charging his last people right into the middle of a battle between two larger and stronger hostile forces, and getting his troops, most of his personal friends, and himself killed. But Dimitri's root, Azure Moon, is all about his ability to overcome his mental illness and hatred, and eventually bloom into an incredibly capable and inspiring ruler, a mythical good king figure, who cares about making the life of the living good rather than avenging the dead. By the end of Azure Moon, you're shown that if his path was a little different, the blood-crazed maniac leading a suicide charge on Grondor Field could have flourished into a sort of man who's willing to hold a hand out in peace to the woman he's been at war with for five years, and who personally betrayed his trust. Yet again, in Crimson Flower, you see a version of Dimitri where his demons never catch up to him the way they do in other routes. He's not the maniac of verdant wind and silver snow, but he's also a lesser man than the Dimitri at the end of Azure Moon, by virtue of never having overcome the trauma holding him back. The Dimitri of Crimson Flower still cares enough about his friends to not pointlessly send them to their death, but he's no longer the honourable and kind young man we see during White Clouds, and he never overcomes his obsession with revenge for the fallen. The point of all this is that Claude and Dimitri can and very much do come across as flawed, dangerous, or even evil from the right perspective, and given the right circumstances, just as much as they come across as noble and heroic in their own tales. Edelgard is the poster child for this writing philosophy. In every route but her own, Crimson Flower, she is unambiguously the antagonist. Edelgard is an invader and disruptor, 
She's the leader of an aggressive expansionist nation, has a scary German-sounding name, personally launches a seemingly unprovoked and very bloody war of aggression, wears scary black and red armor, and uses horrifying monsters literally born from heresy as assault troops. The nation she leads is most commonly referred to as the Empire, her right-hand man looks like this, and one of her top generals is known only as the Death Knight, for crying out loud. She may have many strengths as a leader, but PR definitely is not one of them. To add salt to the wound, she spends most of the game's first half befriending and deceiving everyone around her, only to then turn around and personally betray them, which hurts a lot, especially if you've grown attached to these characters over the course of several playthroughs. She's coded as the traditional bad guy figure in a fantasy story to a T, and it seems that that's about all these brainlets on YouTube can see. Edelgard is the bad red lady, who starts a war on a peaceful continent because she doesn't like the church that runs it. Here's the thing though, if you at some point during the 30 hours of the game that take part in pre-war Fodlin, and that you're forced to replay on every route, open your eyes and look at what's happening on screen, you'll notice that pre-war Fodlin is a shithole. It's run in all but name by a church that's controlled by the Iron Fist of Rhea, an emotionally unstable woman creepily obsessed with her long-dead mom, whose response to insubordination is almost always to execute someone. Religious disagreements had chopped off. Rebellions had chopped off. You invented something that may destabilize the church, like the printing press or gasoline, had chopped off invention hidden in an underground library. Oh, by the way, this underground library is in the massive and squalid tunnel system under your luxurious monastery, and your idea of helping people in need is to let them live in squalor, in what's effectively your sewer system, and then refusing to provide aid when they're getting regularly raided by bandits. You're not even the one who set this up. You had to have one of your church's cardinals annoy you into finally allowing it. Meanwhile, up on the surface world, people are suffering under a bloated and incompetent nobility that's tacitly endorsed by the church, and which is, in the best of cases, sort of passively non-discriminatory against commoners, like most of the noble students in the academy, who are polite and respectful to the commoner students, but who've over the years insisted on having a separate, more luxurious dormitory for themselves for reasons of propriety. In the worst cases, the nobility is pretty chill with, like, casually killing commoners for sport. See Lawrence letting Akron go with what amounts to no more than a slap on the wrist, and literally no one thinking twice about it. In any case, the nobility doesn't really seem to give much of a damn about, or in the worst cases even be aware of, the fact that commoners are suffering from widespread poverty. We know this last thing from... Leonie's and Happy's description of their villages, Dorothea's description of the scholar of her life on the streets of Ambar, and the fact that her entire life revolves around being terrified of going back to living like that, Yuri's description of his life before going to Abyss, Balthus's description of how the noble half of his family treats the commoner half of his family, Merthetis's description of her life after losing her noble status, literally just looking at Ramire village, Ferdinand apparently not understanding why people would want to be nobles, how there's a massive population of people turning to banditry to try to keep themselves fed, in the game we killed these people for XP on our days off, and many many more. Nobility in Fodlin, much like in real life feudal societies, is seen as inherently superior and valuable, an attitude that can poison the best of minds. Ferdinand, my favourite character in this whole game, fight me, is a fantastic person who legitimately cares, and wants to do good. But he spends most of his screen time kneecapped by his obsession with his own nobility, hindered in his ability to care by his strict adherence to an arbitrary set of values he thinks are befitting of a noble. Ferdinand thankfully does get over this in the course of most of his support conversations, and ultimately treats all people with the respect they're due. The same can't be said of Lawrence, who is a similarly well-intentioned and kind individual who never gets past his obsession with nobility, and as such remains a despicable piece of shit, who's never truly willing to help common folk beyond the surface levels. See the aforementioned incident where he lets Acheron, who has killed peasants for sport, go with a slap on the wrist. Lawrence is simply too up his own ass about how he's superior to commoners due to his station, and in the situation with Acheron, too concerned with maintaining his power and status. Ferdinand and Lawrence are both people whose minds are poisoned by the trash mindset of worth being given by birthright. 
The only difference between them is that one gets over this and starts seeing nobility as something anyone can achieve through good deeds, and the other wallows in it and keeps thinking of commoners as essentially subhuman. There is also widespread racism, to the point of people being generally pretty okay with genociding the entirety of Dusker. The tragedy in The Tragedy of Dusker is King Lambert's assassination, after all, and it's only Dimitri and Dudu, who is himself one of the few survivors of the slaughter, that seem upset about the subsequent quote-unquote retaliatory genocide. Even then, half the reason Dimitri seems upset is because he doesn't quite believe that it was the people of Dusker who killed Lambert, a miscarriage of justice, not a categorical injustice. We also know from the way Cyril is treated that there's some very serious discrimination against Almirans. We even have reports of anti-Almiran discrimination from one of the game's lords, Claude, who is implied is only not treated poorly because people either don't know he's half Almiran or are more concerned with his position as the next leader of the Leicester Alliance. Essentially, it's his nobility, and ability to pass as fully Fodlanese, that saves Claude from getting endlessly shat on. Meanwhile, both Cyril and Dudu constantly have people around the monastery spreading racist gossip about them, and suspecting them of being related to basically everything bad that's going on around the monastery. Even within noble and fully Fodlanese families, people's lives are made or broken by whether they're born with a crest, something that's mostly valued so highly in Fodlan because Rhea's church is hell-bent on pushing it as important and connected to the goddess. People like Miklan, a crestless heir, are being essentially cast out of the family as soon as their younger brother is born with a crest. Keep in mind, Miklan is a talented and smart enough guy to raise his own bandit army, and to be able to then use it to attack his home, the fortress of one of the most powerful noble families in Fargus, which is described as especially militaristic because of their proximity to the turbulent Serang border. He then manages to steal a weapon that, as far as everyone knows, was literally bestowed upon his family by the creator goddess herself. But he's not allowed to leave the house, because he happened to not have inherited his dad's crest. I guess he's just not capable enough to go back in time and rewrite his own DNA while in the womb. Meanwhile, people like Sylvain, Ingrid, and Mercedes aren't seen as much as humans with their own feelings and desires as they are bargaining chips all because they happen to be born with a magical doodad in their blood that makes them hit people harder sometimes. This creates an upper class of people who've been completely removed from reality, and the people they're meant to rule over. Sylvain, heir to one of the most powerful houses in Fargus, has been treated as merely a repository of crest genes so often that he starts to hate and resent women. Great trait to have in someone in a position of immense power, I'm sure that leads to great outcomes. Ingrid, one of the most strong-willed and stubborn people in all of Fodlan, who won't shut up about becoming a chivalrous knight, is sheepishly willing to get married off to an evil man at the drop of a hat, because that's what having a crest means, you're your family, or something. She's only stopped when Dorothea, a commoner who's removed from the nobility's crest culture and who's seen what her fiancé is capable of, calls her out on her bullshit. Even then, it takes her fiancé hiring an army to murder her friends to snap Ingrid out of it. Finally, in her support line with Byleth, Mercedes is moments away from giving up her dream of spending her life using her wealth to help the poor and unfortunate, because her adoptive dad wants to marry her off for his personal gain. Speaking of Mercedes, despite otherwise being possibly the kindest and most genuinely good person in the entire game, she at one point shows happiness that Rhea is sent off a bunch of heretics to be executed, because she's a devout believer in the goddess, and Rhea's church poisons people's minds, even people as unbelievably kind as Mercedes is. The point of all this is that Folden, as it is during the academy phase of the game, is a transparently awful place. Not only is there massive poverty and squalor among the peasantry, but it's absolutely dominated by completely awful ideas that guarantee things won't get better on their own. And what's more, a lot of these ideas come directly from Rhea. Now, I stand by what I said before. None of the four lords are completely irredeemable. Rhea is in large part responsible for the awful state of Fodlin, but there's absolutely good in her, uh, and in the interest of fairness, I want to lay some of it out. Much like Dimitri, her ability to reign well is curtailed by mental illness. She is still suffering from PTSD at seeing almost her entire species get slaughtered at Xanado, which translates into her creepy obsession with her mother, the goddess Sothis. It's a big part of why the religions it leads centering around Sothis becomes such an aggressive and evil thing, but I still wouldn't blame anyone for finding Rhea an inspiring figure. 
Rhea almost single-handedly turned Fodlin from a broken land led by the genocidal bandit Nemesis and uplifted it into what's pretty much a standard feudal society, an unequivocal and massive improvement from Nemesis's warlord-dominated housecape. She was also instrumental in putting an end to the various wars of independence that happened throughout Fodlin's history, wielding her power to force the Empire to allow the separation of the Holy Kingdom of Fargus, and hundreds of years later, wielding her power once again to force the Kingdom to allow the separation of the Leicester Alliance. No doubt, without Rhea's intervention, these wars would have turned out considerably bloodier than they did. Not only that, but she's managed to do all this while under the constant threat of those who slither in the dark, an organization which has for a millennium been single-handedly dedicated to wiping her race and her religion out, and who've done their fair share to make Fodlin a worse place themselves. Plus, while the church does do a lot to uphold systemic issues in Fodlin, Rhea honestly does try to make it an organization that helps people, and there's several people in the main cast who would have likely died in poverty or lived much worse lives without the church. But Thelis is as devout a believer as she is because she was taken in by the church during the hardest time of her life, for instance, and Manuela is implied to have a similar story in her past. That said, uh, even through her good intentions and some legitimately good deeds, Rhea is currently, and has as it turns out been for a millennium, the most powerful person in Folin, and most of Folin's systemic issues, which are unforgivably huge, can be traced back directly to her influence sometimes intentional, sometimes in her failure to rule as well as she could have. The misery of generations upon generations of Fodlin's people is by her hands, and the only moral thing to do is to strive for change. Anyone who wields the sort of power that the leaders of the three nations do, and who doesn't push to change Fodlin, is complicit in the worst of Rhea's deeds. Fire Emblem Three Houses wants us to like the Lords of the Titular Three Houses, and as such, all three of them do at least pay lip service to this idea. Edelgard is by far the Lord who wants to change Fodlin the most. She's the one with the most reason to. Despite being the ninth child of the Imperial line, she's the next in line for the throne, because the rest of her siblings were tortured to death by those who slither in the dark, whom they were handed over to for experimentation in the midst of a coup among Imperial nobility. This was in an attempt to produce a child with two crests. She was the only member of her family where the experiment was successful, but likely not without the cost of dramatically lowering her lifespan. The only other person we know of who's gone through the same thing as Edelgard is Lysithia, whose entire character revolves around anxiety about the fact that she'll die young. Edelgard has first-hand experience of the callousness of normals, and nothing but disdain for the worthless fat cats leading the Empire. Dimitri and Claude both also have trauma in the past, but nothing this directly and obviously tying into the problems at Folin's core. Dimitri is also as messed up as he is because of slaughters orchestrated by those who slither in the dark, but in his case they successfully framed other people for it. And Claude is a product of the racism of both Folinese and Elmiran culture. Nobility and crest culture has only benefited him personally. Edelgard's whole life is set in turmoil by two things, the nobility's disregard for human life and the inequality brought about by the existence of crests in their power. This equips her to see Fodlin close to how the common folk do, a place that they are unable to live happy lives in due to power structures that they can do nothing about. Her trauma comes from the exact same place as the common people's oppression does, with one of the major differences between her position and a random peasant's being the fact that she does, indeed, have the power to change Folin. To be clear, Dimitri and Claude both see these things wrong with Folin too, to some extent at least, but they never experience them as clearly as Edelgard does, both being nobles in positions of immense power who have powerful crests and who've never really had the protection of their high status removed. Edelgard has the biggest grudge against Fulden's issues, and she fixates especially on the existence of crests. She explains her train of logic in several support conversations. The nobility is the real issue with Fulden. As long as nobles have power, things like what happened to her siblings will keep happening, and they will be even worse for people who aren't the royal family. To remove the nobility, you first have to remove the importance of crests, because as long as someone with a crest is seen as having the goddess on their side and being inherently superior to the crestless, you can't avoid having a nobility-like structure form. Those with crests will gain and centralize power, and they'll naturally form crest-bearing lineages that maintain that power. The importance of crests comes from Rhea's doctrine, so Edelgard sets her sight on Rhea as Fodlin's enemy number one. 
The fact that it unexpectedly turns out that killing Rhea makes Crest stop existing altogether, which admittedly is a very strange and bad last-minute asshole in Crimson Flower's ending that's not appropriately explained, is even better. This is all to say that Edelgard is, at the very least, well-motivated. Even if you disagree with how she goes about changing Fodlin, which, to be clear, is a very fair thing to disagree on. Every single route other than Crimson Flower is, at least in part, about disagreeing with Edelgard's measures. It's impossible to argue, while paying attention to what the game shows about Fodlin and his people, that Edelgard's motivation is evil. The woman's goal is essentially to abolish the divine right of kings, and then use that to slowly get rid of feudalism and install a meritocracy. If you disagree that this is a good goal, then you may as well stop watching now, because you and I have completely different moral compasses. You're reprehensible, and I just don't care to try and convince you. Now, I think with what I've written so far, I've left the people who initially set me off on this anger right without argument. That's not a hard thing to do. They have an incredibly dumb and indefensible position that Edelgard is pure evil and irredeemable. And by laying out very basic facts about the game, I've made it clear that, at the very least, her motivation is good, and makes sense given the state of Fodlin. They're almost certainly an incredibly small minority, and I don't think most people who dislike or disagree with Edelgard are like that. The reason I got so annoyed is that I think everything I've written above is incredibly obvious, and anyone who thinks otherwise must be incomprehensibly stupid or acting in bad faith. This is the end of the obvious cut and dry section. The rest of this video isn't clear-cut nor objective. I'm going to argue in favour of Edelgard here because I think she's the best lord for Fodlin, and this video is about explaining why I think that. I'm going to conspicuously avoid some of the bad stuff about her that I think is indefensible because that's an entire video's worth of stuff that I don't want to pack into this video that's not about that stuff. And I'm going to point out things I find indefensible about Claude or Dimitri. That said, the joy, or maybe tragedy, of this game is that a very good case can be made for any of the four lords, or even for none at all. I don't think someone's stupid, or acting in bad faith for thinking that, say, Dimitri is the best for Fodlin's future, or for thinking that Edelgard's actions during the course of the story are unforgivable and evil, or even that her initial good intentions eventually give way to her simply trying to get more power. Heck, if I ever play through one of their other routes again, I might be inspired to write a video about some of the things that I like about Dimitri and Claude as leaders. There's just as much to say there as there is with Edelgard. I do think that arguing that Edelgard is evil McEvilson who is motivated by pure evil and evilly wants to start an evil war for evil ends is, to put it succinctly, a dumb fuck take. The main criticism levied at Edelgard is the most obvious. To accomplish her goals, she begins a war that rages on for five years, causing untold bloodshed across Fodlin. This is the hardest pill to swallow about her character. The fact that she is, indeed, the aggressor. That she feels as though she has the right to choose for the entirety of Fodlin. That she's willing to sacrifice thousands of lives across the continent for what she's decided is the greater good. It's a tough pill to swallow. Especially for someone who's as hardline anti-war and anti-violence as I am. The positive gain for any conflict has to be absolutely astronomical for me to even begin to consider whether it's worthwhile, and yet I believe Edelgard makes the correct choice in starting this war against the church. Rhea is, if not immortal, at least inconceivably long-lived. Uh, we see three Nabataeans over the course of the game, Rhea, Seteth, and Flane. We know they all fought in the war against Nemesis a thousand years ago, as the saints Seros, Kehol, and Sathleen. A thousand years pass, and the three of them remain essentially unchanged. Once Rhea dons her battle armor at the end of Crimson Flower, she looks indistinguishable from her appearance in the opening cutscene, and Flane looks no older than 17, and that's stretching it. It's hard to imagine she'd have been any less physically mature than a 15-year-old a thousand years ago, seeing as Saint Sathleen is renowned as a powerful combatant skilled in the lands, and 14-year-old girls aren't exactly known for being built to be killing machines. This is even backed up mechanically in-game to some extent, since the youngest unit in the game is pre-timeskip Lysithia at 15, and she has awful physical stats. This means Flane, at best, has aged two years in a thousand. Waiting for Rhea to pass away naturally would likely mean hundreds of thousands of years would pass under her rule in the meantime. At the same time, Rhea is nearly impossible to negotiate with, maybe due to her trauma, some sort of inflexibility tied to her long lifespan, or simply due to the way she is as a person, 
We see her change her mind about something exactly zero times throughout the game, unless you count her getting really angry at Byleth instead of her usual creepily obsessive mom persona when you betray her in Crimson Flower. On top of that, there's good evidence that the church has stayed pretty much completely the same throughout the thousand years of Rhea's reign over it, with Rhea doing fuck all to change it and actively fighting the tide of progress, like sealing the printing press away because she's afraid it might challenge the church's monopoly and doctrine, for instance. Rhea's hell-bent on preserving Fodlin exactly the way it is, and she's not about to stand down for anyone. The only major changes she's allowed were the creation of the Holy Kingdom of Fargus and the Leicester Alliance, both being the results of hard-fought wars that she didn't step into, and at least the first is implied by information in the Shadow Library to have been the result of her managing a crisis started by those who slither in the dark. On top of that, Fargus was only allowed to exist after giving a great deal of power to the church within its borders, and as a result being by far the most devout nation in the modern day, and the one where Rhea has the most direct power and Leicester was seen as a good way of decentralizing power, so that any one nation would have more trouble fighting back against the church. We know Edelgard's Enbar speech at the start of the war about how the church divided Fodlin into three on purpose is wrong, but her point that a divided Fodlin is easier for the church to control does remain true. We also do get to see what Rhea looks like when the church's grasp on Fodlin is weakened, and it's not pretty. Crimson Flower is not a complete representation of Rhea as an entire person, just like Verdant Wind is not a complete representation of Dimitri, and Azure Moon is not a complete representation of Edelgard, but just like Verdant Wind and Azure Moon, it is a representation of a part of Rhea, and that part is truly monstrous. Rhea in Crimson Flower has good reason to be angry, but she turns her fight against Edelgard and Byleth into something personal, prioritizing getting back her mother over everything else tacitly condoning to do doing war crimes in the battle at Tail Team Plains by not mentioning it at all, and committing horrific crimes herself, burning down the entirety of Ferdiad and explicitly not allowing civilians to evacuate just to slow the advance of the Black Eagle Strike Force. It's also a showcase of the worst elements of the church's culture, and the devotion of parts of Fargus to the church, with Annette, Gilbert, and Ciro, people we know are good, continuing to fight by Rhea's side, even after she gives the order, and Catherine going so far as to be the one who starts the fires. Even before that point, though, we see a side of Rhea that's present in White Clouds, but that comes across way more clearly here. The side of her that equates her own authority with that of the goddess, that sees her own judgment as infallible, and that believes she is the arbiter of good and evil. Rhea absolutely can be the brave, kind woman who takes a missile for her allies at the end of Silver Snow, but she's just as much this callous, self-righteous monster, and the specific thing that triggers that is a loss of her control over Fodlin, i.e. the very thing Edelgard wants to bring about. What I'm getting at is this, the oft-repeated argument that Edelgard starting a war is wrong because she should have tried to reason with Rhea and gotten crests to be less important that way is nonsense. Rhea has been stubborn as a mule for 995 years about not changing anything about Fodlin by the time Edelgard starts a war. And in her time at the Academy, Edelgard has more than enough experiences that prove that trying to reason with Rhea is like trying to convince a brick wall to move. Keep in mind that any positive change Rhea's character sees at the end of Roots other than Crimson Flower, especially at the end of Silver Snow, is still brought about by the war. Edelgard's goals can't be accomplished while Rhea is still in power. Even if they could, and this is a massive if that I'm not conceding, there's no way Rhea's attitudes could be shifted quickly, and Edelgard's on a ticking clock. She doesn't have long to live because of the experience carried out on her, and there's no time to try and talk Rhea into maybe being a bit less awful. At best, Edelgard would manage some tiny incremental changes, nothing as sweeping as it needs to be. If Edelgard wants to enact change, the only option for her is to unseat Rhea, and scrub the power her church holds over Fodlin's ruling structure. And considering how deeply entrenched Rhea is in every single one of Fodlin's institutions, the only way Edelgard can do this is by war. What's more, Rhea's been in power for close to 1000 years, and shown zero signs of any sort of change coming. There's absolutely no good reason to believe that Fodlin will ever get any better, unless Rhea is removed. Even if the other lords had intentions of fundamentally changing the things that are wrong about Fodlin at its core, and they don't, not in the way Edelgard wants nor the way Fodlin needs, Edelgard has no way of knowing that. The usual way that a bad ruler would be removed in a feudal society, 
dying of old age is not on the table here, at least not for several millennia. Another point that Edelgard is often criticised on is that even given the need to rebel against Rhea, her war is too aggressive, as she declares war on both Fargus and Leicester simultaneously to declaring war on the church. Edelgard could just institute her reforms in the land she's the little emperor of, after all. There's some validity here in that both Fargus and Leicester are nations that have broken off of the empire of their own self-determination, and have the right to remain their own countries. The unfortunate truth, though, is that Edelgard's dream of removing the importance of crests is impossible without reform across all of Fodlin. Reforming Adrestia alone wouldn't work, and in fact would likely lead to worse outcomes. Keep in mind that Rhea sees her authority as absolute, and her main way of dealing with heretics is beheading them. Even in the time we spend at the Academy, we see her carry out several executions, and even a complete purge of the Western Church, whose sin isn't denying crests or sothis or whatever, it's just not wanting to bend the knee to Rhea's rule. How, then, would Rhea react to newly crowned Emperor Edelgard working to undo the hierarchy that Rhea spent a millennium zealously reinforcing through religious doctrine and policy-making alike? It'd be a full-force military invasion of the Empire. This means that Edelgard has to get rid of Rhea before she can even begin her reforms, which means that she has to declare war on the Church. Now picture this. Edelgard declares war on the Church of Saros and launches an invasion on Garag Mach. How do the other two nations react? We know Fargus is an incredibly religious nation and a close ally of the Church, so now Adrestia is at war with both the Church of Saros and the Holy Kingdom of Fargus, even in the best case where she manages to kill Rhea in her initial surprise attack on Garg Mac. The Leicester alliance is a bit harder to pin down, since we know that Claude is unable to gather enough support in Crimson Flower to get the Council of Nobles to join in on the war against Edelgard. However, we're also privy to the logic of several of the nobles. To begin with, we know from Lawrence that even in the somewhat less devout Leicester, nobles are expected to be pious. He's not too devout himself, but he can often be found in a cathedral to give off the impression of piousness. We also know from Verdant Wynne and Silver Snow that part of the reason the council ends up split on their decision to join the war effort is that the nobles with land bordering the empire are afraid of losing their holdings. In Verdant Wind, all it takes to get their support is taking over the Great Bridge of Murden in order to be able to guarantee the safety of their lands. This is admittedly a bit inconsistent with Crimson Flower, where the empire doesn't control Murden but the alliance remains neutral. Still, it is mentioned at several points that Claude's House Regan, the most important house in the Alliance, is the leader of the anti-imperial faction, and the neutral front the Alliance maintains is simply due to an inability by Claude to find the support he needs to push back against Edelgard. Claude is a master politician, and I find it impossible to believe that given time and a political climate where the Empire isn't keeping the Southern Alliance nobles in check through the implicit threat of aggression, he wouldn't eventually find a way to break the deadlock and get the Alliance to unite, and join the Church and Kingdom in its fight against the Empire. In fact, this is exactly what he does during Verdant Wind, by uniting with House Daphnel to take over Murden and embolden the Gloucester camp. So, if Edelgard just declares war against the Church, the Kingdom almost immediately jumps into the fray and the Alliance would possibly eventually join the melee against Edelgard's side too. The best case scenario, Edelgard managing to kill Rhea during the attack on Garag Mac, still results in the Empire almost certainly fighting a war on three fronts. As events take place during the game, Edelgard manages to immediately take over large portions of Fargus thanks to her decisive surprise attack, and thus temporarily neutralizes the threat of the Alliance launching an attack on her, which leaves her to just fight the Knights of Saros along with a weakened Fargus. This gives her a massive advantage in Fargus and lets her take over the Alliance on her own terms, helping to avoid spreading her troops too thin, and denying Fargus the ability to strike the Empire's northwestern borders. Even then, the war winds up balancing on the Razor's Edge, and in almost every route, Edelgard still loses the war. The war is incredibly close, with Byleth being the one person whose allegiance swings the entire conflict. Byleth may be an incredible combatant and a genius tactician, but there's still a single person in a war spanning an entire continent. What I'm trying to get at is that declaring war on everyone at once is the only hope Edelgard has of accomplishing her dream, even just in the Empire. The Knights of Saros by themselves are employed to be an army to rival any one of the three nations, and in the unrealistically best case scenario, given that Edelgard doesn't strike first, that being the scenario where Leicester chooses not to get involved, 
Edelgard still winds up fighting a war against two countrysized forces at once, in the kingdom and the church. Not only is Leicester considerably more likely to fight back against an empire in a weaker position, as it would be if not for the rapid conquest of the kingdom south, but it would also be in a significantly stronger position to cross Smurden, take Fort Mercius, and immediately be within striking distance of the imperial capital, the very path that leads to the empire's downfall in several routes. Given that Edelgard starts a war here, which, as I've said, I believe is her only real choice if she wants to make positive change happen, the only reasonable strategic decision is to start a war against Fargus and Leicester as well. She's just setting herself up for failure otherwise. Besides, Fargus and Lester's crest culture and system of nobility suck just as much as Adrestius does, so I'm not going to warrant the downfall of those kingdoms too much. Then there's the final sticking point that I'm willing to defend Edelgard on, and it's her alliance with those who slither in the dark, aka the Agarthans. The Agarthans are basically the only faction in Fodlin that's unequivocally irredeemably evil. Their sole purpose in life is the extermination of the Nabataean species, and they're willing to use any means necessary to achieve it, inciting a bloody five-year-long war, torturing children, or wiping out villages for research, blowing big cities off the map, anything. They're also secretly responsible for a lot of what Fodlan's ills Rhea is not involved in, sometimes assassinating or posing as some of the better members of the nobility, like Lord Arundel or Edelgar's mother, turning their wealth away from good purposes, fanning the flames of racism by inciting incidents like the tragedy of Dusker, generally trying to destabilize Fodlan through acts of bloodshed, and even forcing Rhea to take some of her more draconian measures to try to prevent their influence. It's also implied that they're responsible for those wars of independence that I gave Rhea credit for bringing about a peaceful end to earlier, with at least the original War of the Eagle and Lion being made possible thanks to the strategist Pan, who is heavily implied to be an Agarthan who agitated Lug, the first king of lions, into starting the conflict. On a smaller scale, they're also responsible for some of the more tragic events that take place during Act 1, like killing a very likeable character in Gerald, trying to kill Manuela and Flain, and causing their Amire Calamity, which does a fantastic job of making their evil feel really real to the player by tying them directly to major emotional plot events. As such, on the surface, Edelgard shouldn't have allied herself with those who slid in the dark is an easy and satisfying statement to make. By allying with those who slither in the dark, Edelgard is absolutely complicit in some of the most awful stuff in the game. The kidnapping of Flane, Gerald's murder, the calamity at Remire, the destruction of Arian Road or Fort Mercius. This isn't blood that's directly on her hands, but it's something she deserves to be condemned for. I don't deny this, and neither does Edelgard, I don't think. She accepts her guilt and simply moves on, carrying it with her, though simultaneously she does show up as the Flame Emperor after almost every everything bad that those who live in the dark do in chapter 1, to condemn them and try to minimize harm. However, I do think this point, that her alliance with the Agarthans is evil, is often vastly overstated, and used to paint Edelgard as unfairly negative. The truth is, without the support of those who slither in the dark, Edelgard's war is once again impossible. Remember that while Edelgard was locked in the basement of the Ordelia estate, being experimented on by those who slithered in the dark, Arundel's faction was hard at work in Embar, taking over control of the Empire in what became known as the Insurrection of the Seven. By the game's start, Edelgard's father is a mere puppet of Arundel, who is secretly Talus, the leader of those who slithered in the dark, and Minister of Onire. And so is Edelgard. Her only power as Emperor is symbolic right until she starts the war, at which point the Empire does rally around her. If Edelgard hadn't played along with the Agarthans' plans, not only would she never have been able to start a war, she likely would have been replaced with another puppet of the Agarthans more willing to play along, one who would have fought a war of conquest for them all the same, and upon triumphing would likely never have worked to root out the Agarthans from power like Edelgard eventually does, nor would this puppet have worked towards abolishing the nobility. People forget that until she used the surge of power that she gained by rallying the Empire around herself as a figurehead in the war, Edelgard had no real power to speak of, even as Emperor. 
only with the purging of the Agarthan allied imperial nobility like Marquis von Vestra or Duke von Eyre during her surprise declaration of war does she regain actual control over Adrastia and makes herself untouchable to the Agarthans because suddenly removing Edelgard means removing the figure the entire war effort that they spent the past millennium planning is suddenly centered around. It's a genius move on her part, using the Agarthans plans against them to secure the power she needs to eventually turn on them while making herself untouchable until the war is won and she's in a position to do so. As long as Edelgard is determined to fight this war, and we know she is, even when she's the only person left to fight it and the opponent has a sword to her throat, see the ending of Azure Moon, her only choice is to ally with those who slither until the war starts. It's fair to condemn her by pointing out that she's willing to help commit atrocities on the way there, but at the same time it's also worth remembering that she doesn't really have a choice. The Agarthans hold all the cards right up until the war starts, and any rebellion against them by Edelgard would likely result in her being disposed of and replaced. Then why doesn't she immediately turn on the Agarthans as soon as the war starts is the next question, and it's a matter of simple logic. Those who slither in the dark are incredibly powerful, even after weakening their grip on the Empire. Having them be on Edelgard's side makes the war easier and quicker to win. It minimizes loss of life by hopefully allowing her to swiftly defeat her enemy. Turning on the Garthans wouldn't just deprive her of the power to end the war as quickly as possible, it also opens up another front, slowing the conclusion of the war even further, causing more bloodshed and likely even turning the tide against the Empire. The proof of how important the full-hearted support of those who slither in the dark is to Edelgard's war effort is in the comparison between the situation right after the time skip in Crimson Flower and every other route. Crimson Flower has Edelgard relying more on Byleth and the rest of the Black Eagles, and being less willing to bend to Talus' demands. As a result, despite actually winning the Battle of Garag Malk if she has Byleth's help, Edelgard's position after the time skip is actually weaker in Crimson Flower. She's not been able to conquer Ferdiad and gain control of the center of the kingdom, Arian Road hasn't fallen, the Alliance remains in control of the Great Bridge of Murden, all of which are under Imperial control in every other route. She also has less insight into what those who slither in the dark have in store. For instance, Edelgard doesn't know about the existence of the Javelins of Light when they fall on Arya around it in Crimson Flower, while in the other routes, Hubert is aware enough of them to be able to trace them to Shambhala when they fire on Fort Mercius. Besides, it's important to keep in mind, the Agarthans are sneaky. Edelgard doesn't know where their base is, and it's likely there's still a lot of them in the Adrastian government that she doesn't know about. Taking down the Agarthans isn't a war like her war on the church. It's a war of subterfuge and information gathering, one that's not easy to carry out when there's battles to be fought. We know that even in Roots where Edelgard's relationship with Talas doesn't deteriorate as fast as it does in Crimson Flower, she's still ultimately planning to turn on them. That's why Hubert uses the bombing of Fort Mercius to track down the location of Shambhala, and why he writes a letter revealing its location to the victor of the war in the case of his death. Both Edelgard and Hubert do despise the Agarthans, and they do still want to get rid of their influence on Folan, even if their dream of freeing Folan of the influence of Crest doesn't come true. Before wrapping up, I want to do one final thing. Compare Edelgard to the alternatives. After all, my argument isn't just that Edelgard's a good choice for the future of Folan, I believe she's the best choice. I'm not going to go into as much detail on Clon or Dimitri as Edelgard for obvious reasons, this video is pushing an hour already, but I want to fairly honestly look at what their negatives and positives are. Dimitri, I believe, makes her a really great leader for Frodlin. Once he's let go of his lust for revenge, Dimitri's a kind-hearted, hard-working and highly intelligent individual who knows how to take care of a nation. He's very much designed to turn into the mythical good king by the end of the story, and that's exactly what he is. Under him, Foden would likely flourish and prosper, and his reign would be a happy one. If he's not paired with anyone for his epilogue, there's even talk about him introducing a place for common people to participate in the government. However, Dimitri's by far the most conservative of the three lords. Unlike Claude or Edelgard, he never intends to revolutionize Fodlan. He doesn't want to enact sweeping change, nor does he have any real qualms about the nobility system. He just thinks people should treat commoners better. He's also a firm and devout believer in the Church of Saros, and works with it during his reign. His ending simply mentions he institutes, and I quote, 
a form of government where the people were free to be active participants. And given how adherent he is to the way Fodlan is, interpreting this as Dmitri cultivating a burgeoning democracy or parliament, as I've seen some people do, seems like a stretch to me. It's more likely he instituted some sort of public forum to share problems, or allowing the public to self-determine in small matters like what they're planting that year. Frankly, this line in the epilogue drives me completely insane because of how non-specific it is for such a bombshell revelation, and its lack of specificity leads me to believe it wasn't meant to be a big deal. Surely, if Dimitri decided to do a democracy, it wouldn't have been hidden behind a super missable and vague piece of text right before the end credits. I sort of hate this line with a passion, because it's this potentially world-altering single sentence that's hidden behind a very hard-to-get outcome, and which isn't explained in near enough depth. Whatever Dimitri did, it's laudable, I'm sure, but it's not abolishing the nobility, nor is it removing the worship of crests. I can't imagine it's realistically more than a baby step. That said, the line is vague enough that if you choose to believe Dimitri goes on to institute a modern-day democracy, I can't stop you, and if that's the case, I can't disagree he's better than Edelgard, I guess. Seems like a massive stretch to me, but more power to you. Dimitri coming to power involves Fodlin being unified under the banner of the Holy Kingdom of Fargus, which we know is the most toxic of Fodlin's three kingdoms. This is where House Gatia is, with its habit of throwing away its crestless progeny. It's where House Galatea is, which sees its daughter as nothing other than a bargaining chip because of its crest. This is the land that glorifies death, as long as it's at the service of someone of greater stature than you, be it pointless or not. This is the country which genocided the people of Dusker after a few of them killed its king. Never mind that it wasn't even Dusker that was behind this, but the Agarthans. This is the country that allows Dimitri to charge them to their death in his insanity. Not because they don't know he's insane, but because he's the king, and the king is superior to them. And if the king is insane and orders them to blindly charge into battle against too much greater forces, so be it. They're still his inferiors, and they owe it to him to waste their lives for no reason other than to satisfy his madness. Most of Felix's support conversations, and more than a few of the other Blue Lions members, are dedicated to painting Fargus as an awful, depressing, repressive place, shackled by its adherence to a tradition that was outdated a thousand years ago, and that serves nothing but glorifying death. The entire character of Gilbert is that he feels guilty about literally not dying for no reason in Dusker. His guilt isn't failing to protect Lambert, his guilt is explicitly about failing to die for Lambert. As such, while I do believe Fodlin would have a few good decades under Dimitri's rule, possibly better and more prosperous than Byleth or Edelgard's rule even, I see Dimitri as by far the worst leader for the future of Fodlin. He's a good man who believes in some awful ideas that are taken for granted in his home country, and who, in the process of winning the war, exports those ideas throughout Fodlin. Spreading the culture of Fargus all over Fodlin isn't just never casting aside the worst elements of the Church of Seros. It comes with a whole new slew of awful, anti-human, anti-galitarian, anti-happiness beliefs that Rhea isn't responsible for. Dimitri wants the best for the world, I truly believe this, but his version of this is simply to implement the best possible version of a system that's rotten to the core. The only way for Fodlin to improve is to move forward, but Dimitri is content to stay put and decorate the burning house around him. He's a deeply good man who's tragically mistaken. The only glimmer of hope in his ending is that Rhea steps down as Archbishop and Byleth takes over, but in this storyline, Byleth seems pretty okay with the way things are in Fargus too, since they've stuck around the entire time, so I can't hold out that much hope based on that. Plus, Azure Moon is the only route where the Agarthans are never defeated, so they will certainly cause misery and possibly another war down the line. Even if Dimitri does bring about a brighter future than I'm giving him credit for, there's no guarantee those who slither in the dark won't ruin everything good he does a few generations into the future. Also, I don't have much interesting to say about this, but if we're weighing the lords morally against one another, we have to acknowledge Dimitri's five-year-long murder spree. Yes, it was driven by extreme circumstances, and yes, he was almost certainly mostly murdering bad people, and yes, he spends the entire rest of his life trying to atone, 
but it's there. And if I'm holding Edelgard responsible for a Myra and Gerald, I'm holding Dimitri responsible for wandering Fodlin and stabbing people with a spear for five years too. Claude's a lot more tricky to analyse, because even in his own route, he's a much bigger unknown than the other two. He's more of a disruptor than Dimitri, but he's also opposed to Edelgard's super fast methods. If you want to be annoying, and I sorta of want to be annoying, you could say he's an enlightened centrist. Claude wants to change Fodlin through scheming and political manoeuvring, which is a good idea in theory, but I ultimately don't believe he'd be successful in changing all that much about what really matters. Crest culture and the nobility, which are ultimately the source of all the rot in Fodlin, and neither of which is something you can change from within the system, since as long as Rhea is archbishop, that ain't budging. However, what Claude certainly accomplishes is the unification of Fodlin as a new united kingdom of Fodlin under Byleth, who is free to shape it how they want, and Byleth in Claude's route spends most of the game absorbing Claude's mildly anti-nobility and anti-crest ideas, so it's very possible that they would attempt to counteract Rhea's nonsense, though they are still sympathetic to her in this route. Claude's big signature idea is open borders. He wants to mix the people of Elmira and Fodlin and end the prejudices that two continents share about one another. This is a noble goal, and it would almost certainly shake up Fodlin big time. It would take a while, centuries, maybe millennia, but I do truly believe this would eventually eradicate Fodlin's racism problem, and with that might come changes in attitude that might make things less stratified between nobility and peasantry. Besides, there'd certainly be a big Almiron influence in the culture of the new United Kingdom of Fodlin. Unfortunately, we don't know enough about Almira or its culture to know what that may bring, though we do know it has a king. We also don't know what Almiron's attitudes to matter like nobility or religion are. Basically, all we know is that they like to fight, drink, and be racist to the people of Fodlin. Still, I think this is too little too slow. Claude's Fodlin is certainly an improvement over pre-war Fodlin, but it's very incremental, and it relies on a process that takes centuries upon centuries, two different cultures mixing together. In the meantime, three or four generations of Fodlinese people would still essentially live in the same conditions that Fodlin is in pre-war, and there's no guarantee that anything would even change at all. Wants to prevent Rhea and the Church of Seros from exporting her awful ideas to Elmira and eventually spreading the way Fodlin is in the present day to a whole new continent. This admittedly is an extreme worst case scenario that I have trouble envisioning, but it's not impossible. I do think Claude's a significant improvement on Dimitri, but I find his approach much too slow and risky. What it ultimately boils down to is an attempt to unfreeze Fodlin from the stasis Rhea put it in a thousand years ago by allowing new ideas into it and allowing it to evolve its way out of the state it's in. However, at the same time, Claude fights to put Rhea back in power, which has been the biggest stopper to Fodlin's progress for a millennium, and there's no guarantee that his open borders plan would even stick wants to stop Rhea from rebuilding the fort at Fodlin's throat once Claude's passed away, and returning Fodlin to its previous state. Probably the greatest boon in this route is that those who slither in the dark are definitely and thoroughly defeated, more so than even in Crimson Flower, removing a lot of the pressure from Rhea to be as strict and rigid as she used to be, but I insist once more. As long as Rhea is in power, Fodlin will never be fixed. Maybe she doesn't feel the need to chop quite as many heads off as she used to when she doesn't have reason to see an Agarthan behind every disagreement, but she's still going to spread the same ideas about crests and the nobility as before. The lie she's built around her mother and her faith hinges on crests being a gift from the goddess. One final thought. Whoever you believe is the best or the most moral lord, Edelgard is the only reason anything changes at all. Without her war, Dimitri would have simply carried on to become a remarkable king of Fargus, never challenging any of the power structures in Fodlin. Whether Claude would have managed to open Fodlin's border is more up to debate, but it seems unlikely to me in a Fodlin where the church's xenophobia still runs rampant, and which isn't unified under a king sympathetic to Claude's plans. Claude has throwaway lines about wanting to unite Fodlin, but how exactly did he plan to get three proudly separate nations to merge into one without a war? He wasn't exactly about to talk either Dimitri or Edelgard to give up their throne to anyone else. 
Ultimately, it's the fact that Edelgard accepts the weight of becoming a monster upon herself, a weight that she struggles with every day of her life, no matter what comes to her, that allows Fodlin to change and to break free from Rhea's grip on it. The unified, for better or worse, Fodlin that every root ends on is entirely due to Edelgard's convictions, even if she's not the one who ends up unifying it. While it's not important to deciding whether her actions are right or wrong, or whether she creates a better future, it is important to understanding Edelgard herself to remember that she is not the cold, calculating conqueror she pretends to be. The guilt over the suffering her war causes is a vital part of her character. Under the cold, calculating gaze and under the heavy play armor lies a burning conviction in the goodness of her cause, and an equally burning guilt and insecurity which she talks about constantly in Crimson Flower. The ability to share that guilt with Byleth and the rest of the Black Eagles rather than bottle it up is what keeps her going in Crimson Flower, and what prevents her from turning into, as she says it, a cruel empress with a heart of ice. Depending on what route you choose and what happens to her, you can see her be crushed under the weight of her guilt, retreat into her convictions and be burnt to cinders by it, or learn to share both her guilt and her convictions with friends she can trust. Whatever compunctions one may have about Edelgard's war, however much one may be upset at the destruction and suffering it causes, Edelgard is aware of it all. Her character is that of someone who realizes how devastatingly evil her actions are, and still goes ahead with them. Not because she doesn't care, but because she sees the alternative as far worse, and she understands no one else is willing to take the weight of being the villain who starts a bloody five-year-long war. It's why I think Edelgard, love her or hate her, is a brilliant character, and in general, the thing that I love most about Three Houses is that its lords are all complex characters written in such a way that there's no definitive right or wrong. It's a clash of ideals, and the only thing that you can do is choose which one you think is the most correct, or possibly the least incorrect. Both the joy and tragedy of Three Houses is that each of the lords is a person, with strongly held beliefs. Nothing more, and nothing less. Hi, this, this audio probably sounds quite a bit different than the other one. That's because I'm recording this after the rest of the video is done. Uh, just like a, a little of an afterthought section, I thought. Uh, thanks a lot for making it this far. Uh, it's uh, it's my first video, and I'm sure there's a bunch of amateurs mitched it like that. Like uh, not being able to say the words amateurish mistakes that I've uh, included in. I pretty much had to learn everything from the bottom up, uh, from recording the audio to editing the video, and I had to learn audacity and eventually resolve for it, and uh, it was a bit of a nightmare at times. It was, it was a fun experience overall, but there's definitely times where uh, <laughs> the learning process sort of got to me. Thanks a lot, especially if uh, if you're someone who doesn't like Edelgard and who made it all the way this far. I I know it was quite abrasive at times, but it, it's all in good fun. Like uh, I do think there's some stupid opinions out there on the internet, but I mean, obviously there are. And I think most people who who like Edelgard, like dis, who dislike Edelgard, sorry, I cannot talk, um, dislike her for a good reason. So, thanks, and uh, thank you for putting up with my with my whole angry reviewer shtick. I, I've always had a soft spot for that. Um, I, I made quite a few mistakes while making this video. Uh, the the audio in, in this section is among them because I'm not going to edit it. I'm going to hit noise reduction and leave that pretty much there, but. One of the big like issues I ran into was that I recorded the audio for the video in two bits, uh, where uh, I swear I kept the setup the exact same, like same room. I specified the uh, the the place I put the microphone in, and the second half still came way way out way louder than the first, so I had to do digital noise reduction on it, and it it didn't come across great. Still not sure what caused that have to figure out before making the next video, if the next video does come at any point. Uh, I also decided to play through uh, for my recording session on uh, Crimson Flower Maddening, which was a mistake because it was my first Maddening playthrough and added like 10 hours onto a process that I wanted to be relatively quick, but I'd never played Maddening and Maddening was quite fun. 
there's also a bunch of problems with like not recording bits that I needed. Like uh, I, I got done editing most of the video and then I realized, hey, I'm missing like half the footage here because like I talk about Dimitri and Claude a lot and I, I need footage from Verdant Wind and Azure Moon. So I had to use like the little support viewers and stuff and then I, I was still missing stuff. Like I, I made a little joke about being a clown for forgetting the Lawrence paralogue. Uh, yeah, so it, it's a learning experience, but I, I still had a bunch of fun, and uh, I hope you did too. I, I'm i quite happy with how it turned out, especially for like a first time thing. Uh, I will probably wind up making something else, but knowing the pace I go to, it won't be anytime soon. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for watching, and uh, hopefully catch you next time. I, I do really appreciate it.